means of love. Why do I call it that? One, it's a tension getter. But second, in a few minutes, you'll see why I name my talk Fifty Shades of Love. I believe the mis most misunderstood term and concept in the entire world is love. I really do. I don't think there's any concept that's less understood than love. Maybe truth is there, but love. If any one concept word over all the years, I can't find anyone who can define it, it's love. And yet almost every one of us, now think, this is a contradiction to me, almost every one of us to say, it's the greatest motivation of my life. I did it because I loved him. I loved her. I loved him. And we can't even define it. We'll say, I have a loving marriage. Oh, how do you know? You can't even define love. How do you define love? For about 16, maybe 18 years now, when I do this in the context of a conference, I go out in the audience. I have plenty of time. I go out in the audience with a microphone, and I walk around and ask questions. And the only question I ask, whether it's a pastor's conference or what, I'll say, would you define love? Please define love. Define love. Define love. Define love. In 16 years of doing that, with probably about 2,000 people, maybe three have ever defined love. It just blows my mind. But there's almost always three answers that will surface. Almost three out of the first five answers you get from going around, especially with adults. These are the three answers you get. Define love. God. Really? Define love by saying God? You say, well, Josh, God is love. Yes, but men and women, if you can't define love, that's a meaningless statement. Look, in this room right here, there's at least probably 200 different definitions of love right here. So we'd have 200 different definitions of God. That's insane. Then another, oh, always, and, and in pastor seminars, this always come up. Define love. Now puff up their chest a little bit and say, well, like, dummy, don't you know? Define love. 1 Corinthians 13. What? You define love by 1 Corinthians 13? Show me one verse where it defines love. There is none. You say, well, it's a love chapter, but be careful there. 1 Corinthians 13 does not define love. It shows what love does. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love thinks the best. Now, what is it that causes that patience, that kindness? And then, especially with young people, this one almost always pop out. Would you define love? Well, sure, it's a feeling. What? Love can't be a feeling. Now, Love can result in a feeling, but it can't be a feeling because if love was a feeling, God couldn't command it. You say, why not? Because you, it's difficult to command an emotion. Feel better. What can you command? Anyone, just speak. What can you command? Love would have to be what to be able to command it? I heard somebody say it. A whisper. Action as a result of what? Action as a result of what? Well, we're on it. A decision or a choice. To command someone to do something, it has to be an, a decision or a choice that results in an action. So love has to be a decision that results in a behavior, a lifestyle, an action. Well, what is love? In my country, they did a study of evangelical fundamental church teenagers. 38% of those Christian young people said, sex is okay if you're in love. If you truly love someone, it makes sex right. You know the irony of that? 
probably 99% of those young people can't even define love. And they're saying something that they can't even define, but if you have it, it makes sex right. Well, how in the world do you know somebody has it? Because they want to have sex with you? Does that mean they have love? That's what's so frustrating about that statistic. In Ephesians 5.28, it says, So husbands ought to love their own wives, not their neighbors, not the deacon's wife, no one else, no. Love your own <laughs> wife as their own bodies. What? I thought I was supposed to love my wife the way I love God. No. You destroy your marriage. The standard to love your wife is the way you love your own body. And it goes on, verse 28 says, He who loves his own wife loves himself. I thought it was sinful to love yourself. I thought that was bad. I've never heard a sermon my whole life. I've never heard a sermon and that you need to love yourself and how to do it. I've never heard one. And most Christians think that's a little bit of heresy. Well, then you're talking to the scriptures, not me. I'm not interpreting the scriptures. I'm only relating the scriptures. In Matthew 22, verse 36, the religious leaders were trying to back Jesus into the corner. And he came on with a question they thought would stump him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law, meaning in the law of Moses? What's the greatest commandment? Remember how Jesus replied? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then Jesus kind of backed him into a corner. They got the surprise when he said, and the second is this. Second what? The second commandment. The second from the law of Moses. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't love your neighbor as you love God. No. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. My daughter Katie, when she was, I think, six years old, was at a conference with me or a church meeting where I spoke on this and driving back to the hotel. Six-year-old, this was profound. More profound than any theologian I've heard on this subject. Six years old, she said, Daddy, remember what Jesus said? I said, honey, you said a lot. What, what are you referring to? When Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself, I said, yes. She said, Daddy, think of this. This is profound. Six-year-old said, Daddy, if you don't love yourself, your neighbor really has problems. <laughs> That's true. This is why I say to young people, I said to my three daughters, I trained them this way. Never, ever, 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 ever marry a man who does not love himself. Because as my Katie, a six-year-old, would say, you got a problem. You got a problem. The problem is... I believe the number one cause of divorce among Christians, which is almost equal to the secular world, it's equal to atheist agnostics, the divorcing of Christians. But I believe the number one cause is that the man has never been taught how to love himself. And if a man doesn't know how to love himself, he doesn't have the capacity to know how to love his wife and his children. And that's when there's use and abuse in a marriage and in a home. Because a man was never taught how to love himself. You say, Josh, that's heresy. If you were a pastor seminar, always four or five pastors' hands shoot right up when I get to this point of the talk on love. They shoot right up to interrupt me. And I love it because I just set them up and they don't realize it. They'll say, just a minute, Josh, haven't you read 2 Timothy 3, 2? And I respond back to the pastor, haven't you studied 1 John 3, 2? Why would you do that? 
because the pastor and others say, well, don't you know, look at what 2 Timothy says when Paul wrote that in the latter days, one of the greatest sins will be this. People will be lovers of themselves. You're telling us to love ourselves? That's a sin. I said, I'm not telling you to do that. Jesus did. Paul did. I'm not interpreting the scriptures. I'm just relating the scripture. See, the problem is this. The word used by Paul in 2 Timothy 3 is totally, completely different opposite than the word that Jesus used and Paul used. Let me show you what I mean. In 2 Timothy 3, the word used is philautos. Now, like many words, it's made up of two root words. One, phil, phil or philas, and autos. Now, philas basically means a friendship. I, I think it means a very dear friendship. Some people will say it's one of the three words for love. And I'll say, I'm not sure, I, I've done it many times myself, say philos is a word for love, but it's almost more of a word for a deep loving relationship, a deep relationship. Auto, the second word combined with it, is I, me, but myself. An illustration of this. When they were manufacturing the car and creating it years ago, they said, we've got to come up with a new name. We've got to come up with a specific name to be able to market cars that will separate it from other means of transportation. In what way? Well, if you take a train, a conductor takes you to your destination. If you ride a bus, the driver takes you to your destination. If you go taxi or more intelligent Uber, the driver takes you to your destination. They said, we need a name that would depict that you yourself drive you, take yourself to your destination. That'll be our selling point. So what word did they come up with? Automobile. Auto self, I, mobile, move. I move myself to my destination. That became their marketing thing, the automobile. I move it myself. When you take philos, combine it with auto, the ultimate meaning changes. It often happens when you put two words together, the significant meaning will change. When this, it really changes. When you put the two together, Philautos would be described in Jude 118, whose purpose in life is to sit, satisfy their own ungodly desires. That's what it's going to be like in the last days. It'd be men and women who are out to just sat lovers of themselves to satisfy their own ungodly desires. Or in 2 Peter 3:3, 3, 3, where it says, scoffing and following their own evil desires. That's what it would be like in the latter days. Or, as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, in the latter days they will become lovers of themselves. Now the word that Jesus used was totally different than Paul used. It was a word, you all probably know it, and you're familiar with it. It's called agape. Agape. Agape basically means to think of others first. Not your desires, but their desires. Not your needs, but their needs. Not your wants, but meeting their wants. It's other person oriented. But Josh, you just contradicted yourself. You said you're to love yourself first. No, I didn't say that. Jesus did. Paul did. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you got to love yourself first. And then how do you love your neighbor? Not the way you love God, the way you love yourself. Oh, that's a little different, isn't it? So you love yourself first. Paul said, love your wife as your own body. So you start loving your own body first, and then you love your wife, not based upon how you love God, but how you love your own body is our standard. Kind of weird, isn't it? No, it's beautiful. So, Josh, you're contradicting yourself. You're saying agape means to think of the other person, and you're saying you need to think of yourself first. 
Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And it's not heresy. It's biblical. It's an understanding of the word agape. The best way to explain it in the shortest period of time is this illustration. Over the years, I've had the privilege of making over 20,000 airplane flights, probably equal to anyone in history. I have seen everything. Tr crash landed three times, twice in foam, which was quite an experience. Uh, flying over Panama, my wife, we lost one of only two engines. Fell right off the plane. They ejected it because it caught fire. So they ejected it. You should have seen that plane. Everybody panicked. I said to my wife, honey, honey, relax. This plane is made to fly just as well with one engine as two. It can take off, land, everything. Are you sure? Yeah. Honey, are you sure? Yes. What happens if we lose that engine? I said, Hello, Jesus. <laughs> and there were about 10 people that heard me, and they all panicked, because I don't think they knew Jesus. But every flight I've ever taken, commercial flight, in fact, even most of the non-commercial private jet flights, you hear this phrase. Say it's Delta Airlines. They'll come on and say, the flight attendant will say, thank you for choosing Delta. Lady, there was no other flight, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you for choosing Delta. And then always in one way or another, they'll phrase this. If we have a problem in the air with oxygen, a mask will come down from the above council. And every mother is thinking, I've got to save my child, my little boy, my little girl. I've got to save, I've got to put the mask on my child. No, you never do that. You both would die. What does the flight attendant always say? First, put the mask on yourself. Then, put the mask on your child. What the flight attendant is the exact same thing that Jesus said when Jesus said, agape your neighbor as you agape yourself. The flight attendants say, agape your child with a mask after you agape yourself with a mask. Because if you don't first put the mask on yourself, no matter how much you love your child, whatever, you're both to die. I've seen this two or three times in emergencies and planes when the mask will come down. And the mother will put it on. When you take a little child, they'll fight you. They'll want to rip it off. No, 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 no. They can be six years old and they act like a two-year-old. And you have to hold them behind their head and hold the mask on them. Well, if you don't first put the mask on yourself, which only takes several seconds, then you will pass out and you both die. So what Delta Airlines and other airlines say, first agape yourself. Then you have the capacity to agape. If you meet your own desires and needs and wants, then you have the capacity to meet the desires and needs and wants of your neighbor, of your child, etc. That's what agape means. And when it says husbands... Agape your wife as you agape yourself. Now, what does agape mean? What does love mean? How do you define love? Now, I want to come back to this illustration as soon as I define love. How do you define love? In Ephesians 5.29, it says, No one ever hateth his own flesh. Now, this is a response to right before that, is that husbands, love your wives as you love your own body. Or Jesus said, as you love yourself. That's the model. Loving your own body, loving yourself is a basis for loving your spouse and loving your neighbor. And then the next phrase says, for no man hateth his own flesh. The opposite of what the motto is. And then it says, but. You know what the but does? It offers the opposite of hate your own flesh. No one hateth his own flesh, but. It's the only place I know in the Bible where love is defined. I'm not saying there's not another place, but I've never found it with my Google uh, search engine. And it's definitely not 1 Corinthians 13. It's Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. And so with my son, he was probably 11. I'm pretty sure he was 11 years old. And I'd probably already taught this to him two or three times. With kids, 
no matter what it is, you got to just reinforce it over and over and over again. And you never say to a child, well, last year I showed this to you. Last year I... No, 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 no. You don't do that. You just enthusiastically do it all over again. Explain it, define it, give an illustration all over again to kids. It, they're like adults. It takes a while to sink in. And that's not a joke. Um, and so my son said, I said, to love means to nurture and to cherish. I love teenagers, kids. Dad, what does that mean? That's when as a daddy you're off and running because they're asking you to define it. And I said, well, son, to nurture means to bring to maturity. To bring to maturity. What are you, dad? I said, well... I've got two great heroes in life, Jesus and my wife, usually in that sequence. I said, Jesus is my model. In Luke 2, 52, it said, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, was nurtured or brought to maturity in four areas of his life as the God-man. See, Jesus was just as much God as they've never been man and just as much man as they've never been God. He was the God-man. When well, his humanity, it says, that Jesus himself was nurtured to maturity in four areas. What? Notice what it says. And Jesus kept increasing, meaning brought to maturity, nurtured, uh, nurtured in wisdom and statue and in favor with God and men. I said, son, that's four areas. To nurture yourself to maturity. One, in wisdom, mentally. In statue, physically. In favor with God, spiritually. And men, in favor with men, relationally. I said, son, if I love myself the way God commands me to love myself, and I learn the scripture then by an act of my will, it has to be an act of the will if it's love, by an act of my will, I choose to nurture myself to maturity, physically, or physically, mentally, spiritually, and relationally. If I truly love myself, then I'll do everything I can to put spiritual nutrients into my life to grow spiritually, to grow in relationship with my wife, my children, people, and the body of Christ. I would do everything I can to mature physically in a healthy way by what I eat, what I drink, everything. And then I'll be very careful what I take into my mind. I'll make sure that I, I study the scriptures and godly literature and everything that will cause me to mature mentally. Now I said, son, that's only half of love. It says to nurture and to cherish. To cherish does not mean to adore. I'll get these emails saying, you're teaching young people and others to adore themselves. And I said, oh, get real. To cherish doesn't mean, oh, I adore myself, everything. No. To cherish, basically the word means to care for. In the context here, and this construction would be to care for in the sense of protect. So I said, son, if I truly love myself the way I should, then by an act of my will, I would nurture myself to maturity. Physically, mentally, spiritually, and relationally. Then if I truly love myself the way I'm supposed to, then I will cherish myself. In other words, I will protect myself from anything or anyone who will hinder that nurturing process in my life. Now I said, son, this is how I'm to love your mother. It says, husbands, love your wives as you love your own bodies. Men, women, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I said, I am to love your mother the way I love myself. Therefore, if I truly love your mother, by an act of my will, I choose to nurture my wife to maturity, physically, mentally, spiritually, and relationally. But then, kids, son, if I truly love your mother, then by an act of my will, I will cherish your mother. In other words... I would do everything in my power to protect your mother from anyone or anything that would hinder that nurturing process. And when it says, husbands, 
love your wives as you love your own body. If you do not agape yourself first and mature yourself physically, mentally, spiritually, relationally, you will not be able to consistently love your wife. If you don't keep yourself up physically, you'll lose that capacity. If you don't grow maturity, you won't have a reservoir to minister to your wife. If you don't grow relationally, it'll affect your very relationship with your wife. This is why it says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because if you don't put the mask on yourself first, physically, mentally, uh, spiritually, and relationally, you won't be able to put the mask on your wife physically, mentally, spiritually, relationally. Isn't that beautiful? Now what I want to do is do something I say it's absolutely impossible. I always taught my children, you cannot define, and I believe it, you cannot define a major concept or term with less than seven to nine words. Try it without leaving something out. I said, kids, I'm going to do the impossible. I'm going to define the most complicated concept in the world called love with just three words. No, that, yep, I'm going to do it with three words, and I'm not going to leave anything out. And I could just see my son thinking, yeah, Dad, try it. I said, son, when it says to nurture, write the word provide. That's what it means, to provide nutrients for growth. If your child comes home from school and you say, I want you to go out and fertilize the flower bed. What are you saying to your child? I want you to go out and take nutrients and I want you to place it in the dirt around the flowers. Why? So they'll come to maturity and blossom. That's what to nurture means spiritually. To place nutrients around and in your life that you will come to maturity. So first, you write provide. Second, the word cherish. Write the word protect. Basically, that's what it means, to protect those flowers from anything that will hinder their nurturing process by maybe putting a little fence around it so dogs won't run through it and destroy them or animals or anything else. You will protect them. Some, some flowers, you would protect them from the sunlight, flowers that need shade. And so I said, write down protect. Now take, provide, protect, invert them. Don't ask me why, it's just easier for me to say it. Invert them. And then put one three-letter word in between, and you have the simplest definition of love. Put the word in between, and. How do you define love? Very simple. Protect and provide. If I love my wife the way I love my own body, then with every aspect of my life, I will do everything to protect and provide for her, physically, mentally, spiritually, and relationally. Pretty well covers everything. And it's where Jesus matured through being nurtured in love. To protect and provide. Remember before we started out, God is love, and that's how so many people, Christians, define love, saying God. Well, God is love. But well, what does that mean? So take the word love out and put in the three-word definition, protect and provide. What does it mean? God protects and provides. That's what it means. God is love. He protects and provides, as he did the church. It says that Paul said in Ephesians. We're to love each other as God loved the church, which meant what? He protected and provided for the church. If we love our children, we're to protect and provide for our children. If we love our spouse, we're to protect and provide. If we love our neighbor, we are to protect and provide. Wow. But so many people say, well, Josh, ah, Christianity is negative. The Bible's negative. So often the church is negative. My parents are negative. I say, what do you mean? I don't know what they're going to say. Well, it's always don't do this, don't do that. Thou shall not. All the commandments and everything. Christianity is mere negative. All God wants to do is take the fun out of life. Don't do this. Don't have sex because I don't want you to enjoy it. I don't want you to have fun. I said, boy, did you miss the boat. 
You took a boat that's sinking, not one that's sailing. For this reason, every single commandment in the scripture is an act of love. Every commandment. Why? Every commandment stems from the very person, character, and nature of God. And one of that aspects is love. Every time the Bible says, thou shall not, it's not negative, it's positive. Why? Because every commandment is to protect you and provide for you. How many kids even understand that? I, was, I didn't understand that until the last year of the university. And when I understood, oh my gosh, the Bible's not negative, it's positive. Because God loves me, he issues these commandments from his very nature to protect me and to provide. It changed my whole concept of who God the Heavenly Father is. That's one reason why I wrote, I don't have it here. Yeah, I do. I don't even know how this got into Singapore so fast. It just came out. Set free to choose right. Equipping today's kids to make right moral choices for life. And I wanted to help parents to help their kids to consistently make right choices based upon the person and character and nature of God, that it's all positive. So what you need to do, and I help you in here to do it, on every one of those to show when God says thou shalt not to actually show you how he protects you and provides with you through that commandment. And boy, kids respond to that in a whole different way because you're doing it out of grace and a relationship, not out of legalism and the law. As parents, we owe our children two things. One, a definition of love. Oh, especially in the day of the internet. The internet has changed everything. The internet has marginalized your culture. It has. One of the biggest things I hear when I travel around the world is, well, Josh, we don't do it that way in our culture. <laughs> no one person says that the second time to me. Because I will look at that pastor, whoever it is, and say, you're irrelevant in your culture then. If you live according to the dictates of your culture, you're probably irrelevant. I don't know one Christian culture in the world. I don't know one godly culture in the world. They're all secular. Maybe with Christian words or something, some of them. The United States is one pure secular country. We owe it to our children to define love. Now why? Please follow through with me. Pastors preach. Parents teach. You're to love one another. Young lady, young man, you're to be a loving person. You're to love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another, love one another. We teach you to love one another, love one another, love one another. But we almost never, ever, ever define love for them. You know what's happened in the body of Christ all the world around? We command young people, parents command their children, you should be a loving person. And we never define love for them. For almost every Christian kid I've ever met in the world, the church, their family, their pastor never defined love for them. The world did. The world defines love. Love is sex. Sex is love. Don't believe me? Watch these detective movies on TV and everything, and it was some murder in a room at a hotel or something. And they'll say, well, what was going on? What were they doing? They were making love. No, they were merely having sex. But you see, in the secular world around, sex is love, love is sex. If you love someone, you have sex with them. If you're having sex with someone, you're loving them. Our Christian kids are caught up in that. To me, it's almost evil to tell kids, you should be loving. You should love one another. You should be a loving person, and you don't define love. That's evil. Well, let me ask you a question here. I can get in trouble doing this. 
but I'm in trouble all the time. How many of you here, now if you raise your hand, I might ask you what it is. How many of you here have defined love, not talked about love, every parent talks about love. How many of you here have literally defined love for your children? Two hands. What do we expect of our children? Folks, if you don't talk to your children, somebody else is. It's called Google. If you don't define love for your children, then never tell them they ought to be loving people. Because you set a trap for them. The world is defining love for our Christian kids. We owe it to our children to define love. Second, we owe it to our children to model love, to model, protect, and provide. Because most young people learn more visually. They, they come up over the line with a visual help or an illustration or a story, not just the truth and the facts. We need to model love and the definition that we teach our children. If we're truly going to impact our kids in the 21st century. When I go to a lot of Asian cultures, I hear this, oh, I hear this in China. Well, you know, in our culture, we don't talk about these subjects. We don't talk about sex to our children. I said, oh, get real. I don't care what culture you're from. To me, if you just live by the dictates of your culture, you are irrelevant. Because your culture is irrelevant. Now, that's, I bet you've never heard a foreigner come to your country and say your culture is irrelevant. I'll say it because it's true. For anybody about 35 years old and younger... Folks, grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, really, for almost anyone 35 years old and younger, there's only one culture in the world, only one, Facebook. No, I'm serious. It's Facebook. And if you live by the dictates of your culture, you'll fail your children. You've got to rise out of your culture and speak truth back into it, into your own family, into your own life. Let me ask you a question here. How many of you here have ever straightforwardly talked to your children about pornography? Let me see your hands. Seven hands. Folks, what are you doing? He say, well, Josh, we're an island. We don't have the problem with pornography. <laughs> There is no island with the internet, folks. There is no island. Nobody lives on an island. You think you don't need to talk to your children about pornography? There's 210 countries of the world. It's either number two or number four. Of 210 countries of the world, you know what country is number two on the most time spent on a pornographic, pornographic website, Singapore. The average in the world spending on a pornographic website is, I think, 4.9 minutes. In Singapore, it's over 13 minutes. <laughs> and you don't talk to your children about pornography? Folks, you've got to rise above your culture for the sake of your children. Because if you're not talking to them, trust me, someone else already has. It's called Google and their peers. And I'm almost saying, if you do not talk to your children about pornography, kiss your children goodbye spiritually. You're going to lose them. You wouldn't have 20 years ago in the day of the internet, you will lose your children. You say, well, in our culture, 
you know, you just don't talk about those things. You, you, I feel, oh, I hear so many moms say, I feel uncomfortable talking about sex and pornography. I said, oh, get real, lady. Because you feel uncomfortable, you don't care if your kids get hooked into pornography, and they will. Oh, my gosh, grow up. Because we feel uncomfortable. Get over your culture, folks. We live in a world of the internet. I beg you, talk to your children. Interact with them. You don't talk to them. You interact with them. You talk with them. Listen to them. The greatest thing you can do to help your children walk through the maze of the internet, of all the sexual issues, pornography. <laughs> you think your child won't see pornography? Wake up, Grandma! Wake up, Mom, Dad! Every single kid in the world is going to see pornography. You cannot stop your child from seeing pornography, period! And if you think you can, then you just failed your child. If you think you can keep your child from seeing pornography, you just failed your child. To say to your child, I never want you to look at pornography is like saying, I never want you again to listen to music. You can't even go to a shopping center without music in the background. You get in an elevator, you have the boringest music in the world. Your child will see pornography, period. You don't think so? Do you know how big pornography is? It's killing our kids. There's 26 million pornography websites I can access right here in your church. 26 million. There's 2.3 billion pages accessible one click away right here in your church, in your home. At the restaurant, at McDonald's, at Starbucks, at school, and they're accessing it. But just one site, just one of 26 million sites. Last year, in the last 12 months, <laughs> our minds can't even comprehend this. They distributed 3,199 petabytes of pornography data. Folks, your mind can't even think in the light of one petabyte, let alone 3,199. If just this one site last year, their pornography was printed out, it'd be 1.7 trillion pages. You know how long it would talk, take you to count just the pages of pornography by one of 26 million sites? 300,000 years. It takes you over 200,000 years to sit down and count to a trillion. That's how big it is. If you took just one site and filed all the papers in four drawer file cabinets from just one site in 12 months, it would fill 20 billion four drawer file cabinets. That's one site. Do you know how many of those four-door file cabinets were watched by children? 6.9 billion of them. And you think your children would be exceptional? Get real, mommy. And then these Christian parents come around, they say, well, I can protect my child. We pray over a child. We have family devotions. We take him to a good church. I can protect my child. And then they'll always say this. Josh, my kids are good kids. You've got to understand that. My, my children, the way we raise them, they're not going to look for pornography. I go, oh my gosh. Mom, get your head out of the sand. How irrelevant can you be? Of course your children are probably wonderful kids. They're good kids the way you've raised them. And I can almost say certainly 
For 70% of them, they will never look for pornography. So you say, what's the big deal? You missed it, Mom! Pornography is looking for your child, and it will find your child, period. So don't give me that line, your children are such good children, they won't look for pornography. Because that's probably a true statement. But you're missing the whole point. Pornography is looking for them and will find your precious granddaughter, your precious grandson. Yeah. You know what the age is worldwide where it starts? Eight years old. In pastor's home, pastor, I'm convinced it's about four to six years old. Pornography starts. It's worse in pastor's homes than the regular homes of secular people or anyone else. Yes, you have good children. You've probably raised them wonderfully. And they won't look for pornography. But pornography is looking for them. And let me tell you, they will find your children. And I'll tell you this. By the first time your child sees pornography, which probably you better say in your mind, eight years old. I say five. In your mind, statistics globally is eight years old. If you have not prepared them for the first time they see it because you're a little uncomfortable, well, we don't talk about it. I'm a little embarrassed. Yeah, really. If you have not prepared your child for the first time they see pornography, and they're going to see it, you will probably lose your child, whether it's 8, 9, 10, or 11 years old. Why? Because I've learned one thing through studying research and all. If by the first time you have not prepared your child for pornography, and part of that is defining love, what love is, living it out before them, then when they watch pornography, that child cannot detect a counterfeit from the original. And that's why most Christian kids are growing up, literally all the research shows it, they're growing up believing pornography is sex. Why? Mom and Dad never talked to them. Oh, I'm uncomfortable talking about it. Then why get upset when your kids were watching pornography? If you're uncomfortable. Wake up, mom, dad. Get out of your complacency. There's literally a battle for our children. Folks, you probably heard me say this. I've said a number of times this week. Singapore is unique among all nations of the world. You really are. Singapore is different. Singapore, to me, stands out from every country of the world. What you have here is so incredible. But I'll tell you this. If you become complacent thinking you're so great, and you are great, I've never been to any place on the face of the earth as clean as Singapore. Physically, the streets and all, not morally. I'm not sure it's that clean morally with your young people. Folks, rise above your culture. Talk to your children. Confront them with issues. Interact with them. Listen to them. How do you talk? There's a book out there. It's called The Bare Facts. I wrote this to help parents be accurate in talking to their children about sexuality. So many Christian moms, they water it down, sex and everything else. And that's when you lose your child. Wow. Because whatever, ever, ever you talk to your children about sex, they're going to Google to see if you're accurate. They will, mom. And you better be accurate. And most Christian moms and dads aren't. And that's why I completely documented this The Bare Facts. And then with it, it's got 39 questions your parents hope you never ask about sex. You know how I got that subtitle? With all my books, we do focus groups. Am I communicating? Do they understand it? Where is it short? Almost every single focus book in this group, when it's over, almost every parent said, oh, I hope to God my kids never ask me those questions. So I said, that's a good subtitle. So it came from parents. And then it has a video with it. Oh, is this fun to do. 
the bare facts, 43 answers to questions your kids are asking right now. Each answer is about four minutes long. But because it's video, I have a table with me and I have these illustrations on there I can pick up and I can help to visualize, to illustrate, to remember that biblical concept, that concept about sexuality or something that will help them to remember it. And then straight talk with your kids about sex. The reason I wrote this book, almost every book out there in this subject was written before the impact of the internet. The internet has changed everything. It has totally changed the way we need to talk to our children about sex. Straight talk with your kids. And then one of my three top favorite books, 10 Ways to Say I Love You. This will help you to help your child to see how love, protect and provide, is lived out in relationships. What does it look like? Can you sit down with your child and say, this is what it will look like if you truly love someone? I help you do that. And then, how to have an awesome impact in your kids. Ten commitments for dads. Dad, you are the key. You are the key. And almost every, I don't know of one culture in the world where the number one problem with kids is not the father. I don't know one culture. I make this statement. And I've yet to have a psychologist challenge me because I'll bury him. In my country, 95, same true in your country, 95% of all the problems kids face stem from the father, not the mother. The mother is usually doing it right or trying to. The father so off is out in willy willy land. I have no idea what willy willy land looks like, but it sounds wimpy. Dad, I truly believe the future of Singapore, the future of the church in Singapore is on the shoulders of you men as fathers. Well, I'm going to have lunch with your pastor and then I'm going to the airport, get through security, take a deep breath, get in a plane and spend 19 hours waiting to get home to see my wife. But I live in Southern California. I live right between LA and San Diego. It's called Dana Point. So I want to give you an invitation. I have so enjoyed my time in your country. I'll give you an invitation. If you get out in Southern California, you get around Dana Point, one of the most beautiful places in America to live, and you lost your money. You have nowhere to stay, nothing to eat, no tickets to Disneyland call me. I'm in the phone book. I literally am. I'm listed in the phone book. Call me and I'll pray for you. Thank you. <laughs>